These offenders are um, extremely dangerous offenders. They are very violent and have been very violent. So when it comes down to those guys, there is a lot of risk involved with them. But through the program, these offenders have jobs rolling what we call plastic wire. The gravy was just nothing but water, dude. That's all it was, man. I like this. See, I like the map. See where the water. I don't touch the map. Is that you know the movie uh, Need for Speed? Yeah. Is that Jesse from Breaking Bad? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought yeah. he was, man. Yeah, I, I recognized him. Yeah. What's that one with Lucy Liu? Oh, that's Elementary. But they got this new show coming on ABC, I believe, Endgame or something, dude. It looked really cool. Mind games. Mind games. That's it. It looked kind of Christian Slater in it. Oh, never mind. That, that'd be canceled before the end of the season. Out here working, we can talk to each other about things on the TV and stuff like that. That's good. But we're still wearing shackles, we're still putting handcuffs, we still got guards with vests escorting you around. You know, I want to get out of say. There's got to be a way out. Close 14! And there's monotony on the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. It messes with your mind. Like when I first come to segregation, I didn't really have no problems. I was just angry. But... After I stayed in SEG so long, being isolated, it turned me worse. I had to go to the psychiatrist, get medication. Like when, whenever I don't take my medication, I cut on myself, it cuts all over myself. You know, that's what segregation did to me. Look, I got two life sentences without the possibility of parole. So I'm in prison for the rest of my life. But I want to go home. I want to go home. That's all I want. I want to go home. You know, you ask a lot of these dudes, man, if they can go home, what do they want? Oh, they want cars, they want houses, they want all these girls and Kim Kardashian and, and screw all that. I just want a good job. I'd love to have a wife, a couple of kids, and a dog. That's all I want out of life. That's all I ever want. I screwed up. I ain't blaming my parents or whatever. I did what I did. I accept responsibility for it. And if I got to spend the rest of my life in prison, then I'm going to suck it up and deal with it. That's the only thing I can do. Either that or kill myself, and I'm too much of a coward to kill myself. I feel myself depressed, I shake it off, and I start working out. And I'll work out for at least, uh, at least four hours. And I try to do that to where I'm so exhausted that I don't start dwelling on despair. You have to internalize it, and then after internalizing so much, you know, the mind's funny. feel like you're relevant to somebody you know and if you don't feel like you're relevant to nobody in that cell then it'll make you want to just lose your damn mind you know just go crazy
I remember when I started, I didn't feel like I knew what I was doing or anything. I was uh, 20 years old, and I was just walking around doing a check and looking into a cell, and we had a guy, he was in cell 10, um, who had uh, bitten a hole in his arm. And he was, I remember stopping and looking at it and being like, you know, I was in shock, you know? I didn't really, I didn't know what I got myself into, to be honest with you. And my first reaction, I turned like, I turned sheet white. I was, I was freaked out. And uh, he just kind of looked at me, you know, and he said, shh. And blood was going everywhere. Medical had to come over there. It's a pretty crazy first incident, but it kind of broke me in. Mr. Marsh, you have any lunch today? Did lunch come? Did you accept lunch? Like to talk to me, Mr. Marsh? Yeah, as you know, as I mentioned to you yesterday, we're getting ready to send you over to Marion. How do you feel about going to Marion? Can't say. All right, we're gonna send you off and then we'll look for you to come back all healthy again. Okay? Okay. <laughs> there have been studies that have shown that segregation uh, can have harmful effects on a person's mental health. But I haven't really um, probably been in the system long enough to see that or to track it, if you will. It's just that uh, occasionally we do see that a, uh, an offender who has a history of no mental health services does all of a sudden start becoming symptomatic. And we have no other way to explain that except for the fact that they have been housed in this environment for such a long period of time. What's going on? Why are you back here? I busted my head open. How'd that happen? I was taking a shower and, and I passed out. How old are you now? 71. 71. How long have you been locked up? 54 years. Can you uh, tell us why you're back here? Some severe. It says severe suicide thoughts. Severe suicidal thoughts. And we put you back here on precautions to kind of keep an eye on you, prevent you from harming yourself. Yeah. Yeah. When you're back in the building, uh, what are your concerns about being housed? Where I'm housed is segregation. It seems like I'm forgotten about. Yeah. I think we need, you know, more hands-on, you know, treatment. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, give me things to do, you know, other than being in the cell 23 hours. Yeah. I hear you. It's a challenge for us here. It's a no challenge, challenge for us. Dog. My, my opinion is just they just don't care. Yeah, we don't care. Well, I can understand why you might have that impression. Hey, for real, darling, I need your support. I need your support. I don't want to... Don't throw me back into where I left.
You know, I ain't had a visit in over five years. My family's in Richmond, and it's like 500 miles round trip to drive, and we only get one hour of visit, and you can't touch each other. My family used to come up here once a year, but now, you know, my mom's 73 years old. The rest of the family's dying on me. I call my brother once a month, and I call my mom once a month. That's the only contact I got. Being in the cell and not really being able to uh, socialize and mingle, it's like in a world of your own, and you just like, the longer you stay in there, you just like shut down. But you could talk to guys on event and stuff like that. But that's if you get a person that, you know, is uh, you know, social like yourself. So, you know, I'm on a better event over here now. The vents suck air in and out of the cells. So you can, like, get up on the vent and you can scream and holler at the different inmates in the different cells that's connected to your cell. <laughs> you can make a chess board out of a little, like, piece of paper, make little pieces and play chess on the vent. It's something just to do, just to pass time, you know? Just, um, but yeah, get on there and play chess like you, Bobby Fisher's, um, you know, it's the way we communicate kind of privately without other people hearing us. This pod only has two people on the vent, just for you and one other person. But in other pods, you know, you have four people on the vent. Being able to open up and talk, it, it really helps me to uh, think clearly instead of thinking in a negative way or a way that I shouldn't think. Me and Hanson were on the vent together now, so we know a lot about each other. And he knows me like he can tell in my voice when something's wrong. Like, he might call me and I'll get up and be like, hey. He'd be like, are you all right today? You know, he'll, he'll hear my voice if I don't want to talk. It's like, because he knows me that much. But, you know, and he'll know if I'm in a good mood because my tone of voice. So it's our telephone system. We, we kind of fill each other out. Even though you can talk to other dudes on event, eventually you get some smart ass punk. It's just a matter of time before he starts running his mouth. It's just a matter of time before he starts calling you a snitch and a faggot and all these other things, you know, cussing you out. They'll get to banging on the wall while you're trying to sleep. And you want to get to them because they won't let up. And they'll bang you seven, eight months at a time. And you got the lights on all day long. There's no switches on the lights. And you're just stuck in that cell. And he drives you crazy. If you just sit and just listen to all the different cells, you will hear a thousand arguments all day, every day, just about nothing. It's the anger and the frustration everybody feels inside themselves. You have this, you have this, 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 this rage that just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And little things would just make you go crazy. For instance, mail is like the highlight of the day. You know, when you see that officer go past your door, and if you ain't got no mail coming through that door, you know, that, that, can, that can really be a damper in your day. It's like if you didn't have a piece of bread on your tray. You're supposed to get two pieces of bread on your tray. If I was missing a piece of bread on my tray, I would explode. They didn't run mail yesterday. They didn't run mail because of whatever reason they didn't run mail for. 
walk around the cell for hours. You can just walk in circles and circles and circles and circles and circles for hours and just, just think. You can't move. You can't move, you can't just walk around in circles. I don't expect the administration to understand what we go through behind them doors. There is no rules for the administration. They have no rules. They make up their own rules. They didn't come tell me why they didn't run the mail. They just told me that they didn't run the mail. If I didn't have a salt on my tray, give me my salt. I want my salt now. You know what I mean? Like it, it just, but it, but what it, it was that. It's like two totally different realities. So when Monday comes around, I'm looking for this mail and I don't get it. But don't nobody tell me nothing. Don't no CEO say nothing to me. Don't nobody come around and say, hey, they're not passing the mail out because of whatever. And if we don't get what we deserve or what we're supposed to have, and even with, even if we speak up and we snap out and go crazy because we're not getting what we're supposed to have in their guidelines, and then we're deemed as being disruptive to the security and it's just all these different things that they stack on you. We have rules stacked six feet above our head. They don't follow the rules that they have in place, but they want us to follow every single rule by the T. Walking in circles and just laying down all day. And it makes you just want to just rebel and just be like, I don't care about none of the rules now. I don't care because even the rules that I follow, where's my other piece of bread? You know what I'm saying? Fuck them, <laughs> for real. Oh man, like fuck them, you know, because in that cell, you just got so much anger. How we end up fighting? You know, like you gotta come in this cell and you gotta you gotta beat me up. You gotta beat me up. You gotta come here. I wanna fight you now. I just got so much pain built up inside of me. I wanna just feel it. You know what I'm saying? Give it to me. Like, don't play with me, just give it to me all the way. In that cell, don't nothing matter. I used to act out. I used to throw feces on the guards, feces on the inmates, get the uh, extraction team, the officers to come in my cell and fight them and get gassed up and get beat up and strapped down in five-point restraints and all that. I've seen a lot of people get hurt really bad over the years during cell entries. Uh, busted knees, ankles, elbows, arms, um, you know, inmates, um, actually getting their hands on an officer, it's very dangerous. I remember one time I got together, you know, a few guys, and we ended up covering our windows and just having a battle with the administration. And so they ended up coming in my cell, and we started just having to just a full-fledged physical combat. I used to love it. I mean, I really did. I used to love it. Why? Getting fired up. Um, you have to get in a certain state of mind before you go into a cell and fight another human being. It's combat. It's combat. Uh, it's kind of like the same feeling you get when you score a touchdown uh, or hit a home run. Uh, you got to get pumped up. When it comes down to using force to enforce rules, regulations, uh, whatever it may be, we will we will do what we have to do. When you're dealing with higher level offenders, their history, a lot of times it's extreme violence. So we have to treat them as such. Bottom line, my job is to protect the public safety and protect those staff that are here, protect the offenders. That encompasses a big picture. So we have to consider the big picture. What is best? What is safe? What is safe for all?
I'm 35 now. And basically from the time I was 11 years old, I've been incarcerated. I've only spent maybe a year and a half on the street. When I was uh, 10 years old, my dad left my mom. So me and my brother, we went back and forth between uh, my dad and my mom, and neither one of them wanted us. So they put us up, you know, in the foster system. So there was like a 17-year-old foster kid there, and he started bullying my brother. So I grabbed a pool cue and just started wailing on him with it and beat him down. And, you know, so I got kicked out of there, and I went to a group home. It's the bottom of your feet. So one day, this place had uh, banana splits. I'd never had none. Even to this day, I've never had one. I always wanted one. You know, that was like the quintessential thing as a child as a banana split. And uh, the dude there wouldn't give it to me. I got mad. I'm gonna kill myself if you don't. Oh, I don't think you will. You ain't got it in you. So I grabbed a fork and I shoved it through my wrist. I was about maybe 11 at the time. It took me to the hospital. You know, got kicked out, went to another foster home. Started getting in trouble. I stole a car, got busted, and uh, I go to juvie. You go to juvenile prison in Virginia, you fight every day. You know, and I did several years there. And that doesn't mean I've won every fight. I've got my ass whooped more times than I've won. But they don't call it gladiator school for nothing. So I make my way out, and I was living with my grandma at the time. And I tried to join the Army. But uh, they told me that I had to be six months off parole and probation before I could join. Got a job working electricity in Charlottesville. Uh, that was fun, because I've always been good with my hands. And uh, my grandma needed a stove. Hers was falling apart. So for Christmas, you know, I go and I get it, uh, you know, put a little down payment on it. But I get fired. And now I can't make the payments. There's no way in hell I'm gonna let them come repossess my grandma's stove. I'm like, man, you know what? Screw it. I can't get a job. I know what I'm good at. I break in the house, steal a couple guns. I steal a brand new 97 uh, Subaru Legacy Station Wagon. And I steal a bunch of other stuff. I got a gun. Got bullets for the gun. I'm headed up Interstate 29, 120 miles per hour in a station wagon. I mean, I'm getting it. You know, I'm like 19 years old. And the car's almost out of gas. I pull into the store, I fill up. I don't got no money on me. So I walk in, I grab a Coke. I walk up to the store owner. I just put a gun in his face and give me your money. So he pulls the money out of his wallet and he gives it to me. Open the cash register. Give me the money. He opens it. He said, man, take the money out and give it to me. He said, no. He said, man, if you don't, I'm going to kill you. He looked me square in the eyes and he said, young man, I don't think you will. I shot him in the chest. He fell behind the counter. I reached over, shot him twice in the back. I walked down the counter, walked back up, and I stood over top of him and I shot him six more times in the back of the head. Um took the money and I left.
What you gonna do when somebody attacks you? I mean, go do what you gotta do. It's not gonna matter what program you put in front of somebody. So when I found out they was bringing me back, I was pissed. I was mad. Knowing that I was coming back to long-term segregation, I had to start getting my mind right. Because once you come over here, you don't know how long it's gonna be before they let you go and send you back out into the prison world, back in the population. I know I tried to escape, and that's why I'm here. I have no one to blame but myself. But at the same time, I'm not a violent inmate. And I have 18 years of demonstrating that. So you put me back in general population, I, I will not mess up. It was, it was a slip, uh, a lot of stuff going on in my head at the time. Um, I regret it every day. I regret it every day. Uh, so You're just, right. Uh, um, will never be forgotten. You can't erase the virus. But this is not the end. It's still a work in progress. How long and where it's going to lead to, I can't answer that now. But it is a work in progress. Right. Okay, Mr. Bain. Uh, I've always told that, and then it's, it's still never, I guess you know, uh, Progressing, I guess. You've had that opportunity in general population. You've proven at the time that you couldn't capitalize on that opportunity. You slipped, you made a mistake. From this point, you're working to regain that opportunity you lost due to your actions. Uh, me personally, I, I would love to progress off of right on you. You know, not just, you know, but. Uh, that door closes and you're in that confined spot. I couldn't imagine, for real. Uh, it would be awful being in here anyway. Yeah. That isolation wouldn't be something I don't think I could deal with easily either. Um, I think not being able to roam around would really, really take a toll on me. Yeah. I don't think I've actually thought about it as far as how I would act if I was behind the door. Kill a man. Should I have lost my life for the act I did? I took that man's life. I took him away from his wife, from his children, from his grandchildren. I took him away from his business. Who knows what happened to his family after he lost his store and lost his job? There's so many consequences that could have came from my actions. I took that man's life. 
Am I being punished enough? In my opinion, no, not even close. But seven, eight years of segregation isn't working because all it does is make you angry. It makes you more frustrated. All it's doing is turning us into caged animals. TV, you know, I make my own reality television entertainment, and I got the hound dog. I like the hound dog. Hound dog, hot on that gal tail, hot on that tail. You know, it's good entertainment too. You know, keep myself entertained. Try to, then you know, like I said, I be having suicidal thoughts, and so I try to keep myself in good mood most of the time, right? You know, when you look in the cell, you can't see out the window. I don't know, and I mean, that's an old torture technique caused uh, deterioration of the brain. You know, the brain needs a uh, sensory, like any organ needs exercise, sensory deprivation. That's what it's called. So that's why I'm kicking on the door. Every day is exactly the same, exactly the same. Every single day is exactly the same. In that cell by yourself, it's like you're not in prison, and it's like you're somewhere else. You're just away from life. You're just away from life, period. I don't know if hope is what's keeping me going. I just think it's uh, my inner strength. I guess my, I, I, it's either I'm gonna find the strength or I'm gonna kill myself. You know, it's either one or two. So I haven't killed myself yet. So, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm just trying to make it. And I'm just. shackles, been wearing them for 17 and a half years. That's a long time. I've done more time in segregation than some guys got for murder. I ain't killed nobody. I've been doing what they told me to do. I've been acting right. I ain't been getting in no trouble. And as long as I do that, I don't see no reason why they can't let me out of segregation. Because I'm going to die in prison. But what I did doesn't merit no death sentence. The judge didn't give me a death sentence. Why you give me a death sentence? Keeping me in segregation for the rest of my life is a death sentence. That's the way I look at it. without hope. What's the point of having a life if you just exist in it?
I'm tired. I'm frustrated and I'm a little bit weak. Borderline depression, so to speak. You know, I think every human deals with it, regardless of where you're at. And how do you deal with it? Fantasizing, you know, just about going to different places. You know, I I create entire landscapes in my mind. You know, uh, I have that ability to where I can close my eyes. And I can actually paint it. I can actually see it. I can actually walk through it. Sort of like a 3D model on a computer. Um, I pretty much do it every day. I'll cross my hands behind my back and I'll just close my eyes. You know, I just will it to exist. And then I'm able to step into it. Sometimes it's childhood places that I've been, you know, like the woods when I was growing up. When it got too bad at home, I would just take off into the woods. In the woods, I was comfortable. I was safe. I didn't have to worry about getting the hell beat out of me. When you're walking through the forest, you know, climbing up the mountains, you know, and you feel the sponginess of the pine needles underneath your feet, you know, the branches, you know, brushing up against your clothes, the fresh air, you hear the squirrels chittering at you because you're invading their territory, the birds swooping around your head. You know peace. You know contentment. You know that this right here is what God created this world to be. He didn't create it for violence. He didn't create it for strife. He didn't create it for murder, rape, robbery, you know, lies and deceit and trickery. He didn't create it for all that. When you're out there in the forest by yourself, you know, and you're 20, 30 miles away from the closest person as far as you know, you get a true glimpse of what Eden was. You know, you get a true glimpse of what life is supposed to be. You know, it's your own little personal utopia. You know, it's a perfect environment. You know, it's the one place where I was happy.